Liverpool Football Club, the most successful English team in the history of European competitions with six European Cups, three UEFA Cups and four UEFA Super Cups. I'm sure you know these guys. And if you're Egyptian, you definitely know these guys. Yeah, there's no question about it. In any case, there have been plenty European victories in the history of the Merseyside club. So many wins and so many accolades that at the peak of it all, they were sky high and looking pretty much untouchable. As you can imagine, this kind of dominance is rarely universally accepted. As a matter of fact, some even decided to dedicate large portions of their lives to knocking them off their perch. And they were so good that there was once a time where a dream like that seemed impossible. Do you... do you see what I did there? But this video isn't about those guys, it's about these guys. A Liverpool team that despite their rich history in European competitions was in a bit of a slump. A team that very many people had their doubts about. A team that even when they had gotten ever so close to the finish line was still expected to slip and fall. A team that completed the miracle of Istanbul. Today, we'll not only be looking into this incredible victory, but we'll also be diving into the history of Liverpool Football Club as a whole to track the events that led to this momentous achievement. Buckle up, because even though we've got a long one coming up, it's a goodie. So without further ado, how did Liverpool win the 2005 Champions League? Yo, what is going on everyone, hope you're all doing well. Do me a favor and treat the like button like an Egyptian would treat a Twitter poll for any award involving or not involving Mohamed Salah. That is to say, destroy it. Moving along, we've got a lot to cover today, so let's go ahead and start things off from the very beginning. The origin of Liverpool Football Club didn't actually involve anything red in the slightest. The colour of choice was actually blue. As a matter of fact, it didn't start with Liverpool at all, rather Everton Football Club. All the way back in 1878, Everton was formed. After a couple of years following their formation, they moved into a legendary stadium in 1884. A stadium that, ironically, the Toffees would eventually come to resent over the course of the next 130 plus years, Anfield. I say this because since 1999, Everton have only beaten Liverpool at Anfield once in all competitions. They've played there 23 times in that time period, although that win did come in early 2021, so perhaps times are changing, but who knows. In any case, the move was orchestrated by the president of Everton, John Holding, who would eventually go on to own Anfield. Holding, a very wealthy businessman, and also a man who once served as the Lord Mayor of Liverpool at one point, had his hands in much of what was going on at Everton. He was even at the forefront of the club as they became founding members of the First Division back in 1888. However, many believe that a lot of his actions were simultaneously working towards the detriment of the club and the benefits of his pockets. For example, the players were forced to change in subpar changing facilities and he planned to float the club to purchase more land. One of the final straws came about when he decided to increase the stadium rent from £250 to £370. This didn't go down very well. The Everton board of directors decided that enough was enough and decided to skedaddle, establishing themselves at Goodison Park. That left Holding with a dilemma. A stadium with no team to play in it. And so, he did the most logical thing. He decided to form a new team that would occupy that stadium as their home ground. The name of that team? Everton Athletic. Not quite. It goes without saying that that name was rejected. Too derivative. Instead, they adopted the name Liverpool Football Club as the club was formed in 1892. Now established as a club, Liverpool were initially rejected from entry into the Football League on account of them only existing for a few days. Although, after a few years of good performances, they were admitted to the second division where they went unbeaten for 28 games, finishing top of the league. This earned them a playoff match against the bottom team of the first division to gain entry into the top league, a match which they won. Their opponent? Newton Heath, a team that would later come to be known as Manchester United, a precursor for the rivalry that was to come. Not much of a rivalry these days though. Anyway, after a relegation some years later, the club appointed a man by the name of Tom Watson. That's quite the moustache, right? 
This guy had just won three first division titles with Sunderland and Holding had seen enough to make him the highest paid manager in England, earning him a mind-boggling yearly salary of £300. My man was rich. This investment paid dividends as Liverpool went on to win their first first division title with him as manager in 1901. They did get relegated in 1904, but they regained promotion immediately and became the first English club to win the second division, then win the first division in back-to-back -back seasons. It's pretty impressive. The years following this impressive feat were rather uneventful for the Reds. An array of mid-table finishes with one flash in the pan second place finish in a nine-year period. However, there was a bit of spice. The Great War had begun in 1914 and the Football League was tipped to halt operations indefinitely from the end of the 1914-15 season. A match between Liverpool and now Manchester United, formerly Newton Heath, was rigged to end 2-0 to Man U. After investigations, it was found that a small group consisting of both United and Liverpool players had been involved in this act with no input from managers and backroom staff. They had each placed large bets on the result of the match and were intending to secure a large bag from this unscrupulous act. Shameless. Although I'm, I'm not gonna lie, how, how much was the bag? I'm just, just asking for a friend. <clears throat> anyway, there were a few reasons why this game was rigged. For starters, United were battling relegation and needed a win to stay up. However, the main reason seems to be financial. Liverpool were mid-table, so it wasn't like the game would have affected them win or lose. But with the war at hand, the careers of several players across the country looks to just about be over. So at this point, you may be asking, how were they found out? Fred Pagnum, a Liverpool player and probably one of the first snitches in recorded football history, had disapproved of his teammates' shady dealings. This guy threatened to thwart their plans and even hit the crossbar towards the end of the match in an attempt to ruin the scoreline. When his teammates started arguing with him for doing his job, the people started to suspect something was up. To be fair, with the way United are defending nowadays, I am not sure how match fixing hasn't been brought up. Or or maybe they're just bad. This is, this is also a possibility. Anyway, back to Pagnum, this man even testified against his teammates in a hearing with the FA. I'm sure they were less than pleased. There's always that one guy that grosses up and ruins it for just about everyone, huh? Anyway, all players involved from both sides were given lifelong bans from football, although most bans were lifted years later. Moving along, over the next roughly 50 years, Liverpool's situation fluctuated a heck of a lot. Back-to-back -back first division wins in 1922 and 1923 following the end of World War I and years of mid-table mediocrity until about 1939 when the Second World War came knocking. A first division win in the first season upon resumption of the league in 1947 was good stuff, but more mid-table mediocrity directly after that and a relegation to the second division in 1954 was bad stuff. This takes us all the way through to the 1959-60 season of the first division. After a poor start to the season, Liverpool were far from where they wanted to be. Phil Taylor, the manager at the time, decided to step down in November of 1959 as he felt he had taken Liverpool as far as he was capable of taking them. Promotion back to the top division was proving to be too big of a task. However, an insurmountable task for one man can sometimes end up being an opportunity for greatness for another. Less than a month later, Bill Shankly arrived. Buckle up because this is a long segment. In the early 60s, things began to change around Anfield. A team that was pretty much perpetually hot or cold since its existence began to kick into a whole new gear. Upon Bill Shankly's introduction to Liverpool, the team was drastically revamped. 24 players were placed on the transfer list with all of them out the door within a year. As a matter of fact, it was more than just the team that was revamped. The former Melwood training ground was revamped, Anfield itself was in a state of disarray and needed to be cut, watered and attended to. Fans had lost a lot of interest in the club over the years as they continuously failed to make it out of the second division. There was much to be done. Shankly adopted a detail-orientated, pragmatic approach to managing the Reds that saw him do just about everything he could to give his men just that little edge in battle. Fitness, training techniques beyond their time, and genuine innovation was the order of the day. But above that, Liverpool became a team that the people of the city, and the world for that matter, truly began to resonate with. 
Under Shankly, Liverpool became something more than just a club, more than a group of people that just kicked a ball about. Without having this video run for hours on end, let me give you just a few brief bullet points detailing his 15 year stay at the club. 1. Liverpool gained promotion to the first division by winning the second division in 1962. By 1964, they were first division champions once more. This victory and the attractive attacking football that was on display caused fans of a once mediocre Liverpool to consistently return to Anfield in their masses. 2. The club transitioned from wearing a red top with white shorts and white socks to wearing the iconic all red strip. Hard to imagine them any other way. 3. You Never Walk Alone became Liverpool's signature anthem. This is something that was pretty much made official as the crowd boomed the song during Liverpool's 1965 FA Cup victory over Leeds in the final. And the Liverpool signature tune of You'll Never Walk Alone, rising from the terraces. 4. The famous This Is Anfield plank was installed in the player's tunnel, a piece that would instill fear in the hearts of the opposition for years to come. Finally, and perhaps most importantly, 5. Shankly understood the importance of the fans in the entire affair. The popular and very real notion that the cop end could suck the ball into the net was one that started with him. When addressing the fans, he was the epitome of emotive. Growing up in a small working class town in Scotland, he knew how much football meant to the spectators. Liverpool is not only a club, it's an institution and my aim was to bring the people close to the club and the team and for them to be accepted as part of it. The effect was that wives brought their late husband's ashes to Anfield and scattered them on the pitch after saying a little prayer. I said to them, in you come, you're welcome, and they trotted in by the dozen. One young boy got killed at his work and a busload of 50 people came to Anfield one Sunday to scatter his ashes at the cop end. So people not only support Liverpool when they're alive, they support them when they're dead. This is the true story of Liverpool. This is possibly why Liverpool are so great. There is no hypocrisy about it. It is sheer honesty. The words of Shankly, who upon his own untimely passing in 1981, had his ashes scattered at the cop end. Another factor that Liverpool had in their favour was an idea. A notion fostered within the club that over time would come to be known as the Liverpool way. This idea has been referenced prior to the Shankly era, but it was surely during his time in office that it really grew to mainstream prominence. Depending on who you ask or where you look, you may get contrasting answers on just what exactly the Liverpool way is. One distinct definition seems quite hard to come by. However, I feel a good summary that I would imagine many would agree with came from sports writer David Goldblatt. The Liverpool way was a tradition of simple football, pass and move, defending and attacking collectively, continuity of staff and players, respecting player autonomy but insisting on solidarity. Possession was the first priority, the virtue of patience extolled. In short, it was and is a big deal. Shankly's success in his tenure was owed to a plethora of reasons, but one of the greatest contributing factors to the insane success that Liverpool would go on to have in the years to come was a fabled meeting room simply known as the Boot Room. A small boot storage room that was converted into a meeting place for the internal coaching staff at Liverpool during the Shankly era. It was here that the very essence of the Liverpool way was carried out, discussed and practiced on a daily basis. The coaching staff would essentially talk shop, strategize and conjure up ways to best utilize the players at their disposal and crush the opposition. The founding members of this legendary meeting place were Shankly himself, Bob Paisley, Ruben Bennett, Tom Saunders, Joe Fagan and Ronnie Moran, all prominent figures in Liverpool's history. But three names there perhaps shine brighter than most when placed next to other icons of English and world football history, Bill Shankly, Bob Paisley and Joe Fagan. Between these three, Liverpool had their managerial mandate for 26 years between 1959 and 1985. Okay, you've waited long enough, let's go over some achievements. Firstly, we have Shankly. Three First Division wins, two FA Cups and a UEFA Cup. Not too bad. Next up, Paisley, a man who the author of Bill Shankly's biography, Stephen Kelly, described as the true tactician of Liverpool with Shankly being the motivating force. Six First Division titles, three European Cups, one UEFA Cup and three League Cups. Madness. And finally, Joe Fagan. 
a man who became the first ever manager of an English team to win a treble of major honours in a single season, a European Cup, a League Cup and a first division title. That was in his first season in charge. Kenny Dalglish, Graham Souness, Kevin Keegan, Ian Rush, Ray Clements, all players that laced up for Liverpool during this period of incredible success and gained legendary status in the process. I don't know about you guys, but I think that the Liverpool way was more than just a mantra. Going into the 1984-85 season of the first division, Liverpool were the undisputed kings of English football. At this point, they were far and away the club with the most league titles in the country with 15 league trophies. Arsenal was sitting all the way back in second with 8. Despite this, the 84-85 season was not all that successful for them. A second place finish, 13 points below rivals Everton and knocked out of the FA Cup in the semi-finals against the eventual winners, Manchester United. However, they did make it to the European Cup final and were matched up against Juventus at the Hazel Stadium in Brussels on the 29th of May 1985. That's unfortunately where disaster struck. The Hazel disaster. The exact cause of what transpired and who the exact instigators were is contested to this day, but the blame for what occurred has almost unanimously been placed on Liverpool supporters. Only short moments before the match began, a horde of Liverpool fans bypassed a fence separating them from a neutral spectator zone and charged at the Juventus fans. A retaining wall holding up that section collapsed taking the lives of 39 people, the majority of whom were Juventus fans or of Italian descent. The stadium was understandably in a state of unrest after this. However, due to fears that postponing the match would lead to more civil unrest, the game went on. A 1-0 win to Juventus. In the aftermath of what has been described as the darkest hour in the history of UEFA competitions, all English teams were banned from UEFA competitions for five years. It was a catastrophe. In the years that followed, Liverpool continued with their success with Kenny Dalglish taking over the reins as the player manager. Three first division titles and two FA Cups as the likes of John Barnes and Peter Beardsley among others were added to the mix. However, it seems disaster was never too far away from the club. This time, disaster struck in Sheffield. The Hillsborough disaster. The event was an FA Cup semi-final between Liverpool and Nottingham Forest at the Hillsborough Stadium on the 15th of April 1989. With only 6 minutes on the clock, the match was abandoned as overcrowding in the stands led to a stampede that caused the death of 97 people. A failure to control the crowd on the behalf of the police and stadium officials was identified as the cause of this devastating event. In the aftermath of this disaster, it was made compulsory that stadiums belonging to top teams must be all-seaters. This led to the destruction of several iconic standing areas such as the Spion Cop. Liverpool went on to win the replay of the semi-finals and also went on to win the FA Cup as a whole as well as the league the next season. However, over the next decade or so, Liverpool more or less lost their way. That wasn't a pun, I promise. Okay, I'm not gonna lie, it was. I'm sorry. Putting it bluntly, the 90s is a period that most Liverpool fans would probably rather forget. Manchester United, historically Liverpool's biggest rival, had just gone 26 years without a league victory while Liverpool absolutely ran rampant. And then this guy showed up. Times were about to change. In 1992, football famously began when the Premier League was formed. United won six of the first eight Premier League trophies available and helped themselves to a treble in 1999 while they were at it. Liverpool, on the other hand, had lost the source. They did win the FA Cup and the league in this period, but they were far from what they used to be. The iconic boot room was demolished and replaced with a press room. They failed to make sustained title pushes throughout much of the 90s and there was of course the infamous Spice Boys Cream Suits incident. After gaining considerable success and media attention, off the pitch, a group of Liverpool players known as the Spice Boys wore cream Armani suits to the 1996 FA Cup final against Manchester United. Jamie Redknapp, David James, Steve McManaman, Robbie Fowler and a couple more notable names. In hindsight, this was perhaps not the best choice of attire. When Sir Alex Ferguson saw them, he apparently immediately turned to his assistant coach and said, 1-0 and the game ended 1-0. But there were positives to this period of time. Liverpool played some great football at times. 
Stars such as Robbie Fowler and eventually Michael Owen, Stephen Gerrard and Jamie Carragher all took to the pitch for them. And after Gerard Houllier was appointed as manager in 1998, even more top talent was brought in. So much so that by the end of the 2001 season, Liverpool had won a very unique cup treble consisting of the League Cup, the UEFA Cup and the FA Cup. Not bad. Perhaps Liverpool were on the up once more. Or perhaps not. Fast forward to 2004 and Liverpool were no closer to reclaiming the top spot in English and European football than they had been when they won the cup treble three years prior. Julier was unfortunately deemed to not be good enough and was subsequently shown the door. In his place came the last man not named Diego Simeone to prevent Barcelona or Real Madrid from winning La Liga, a man who had just come off success in Spain's Premier Division as well as the UEFA Cup, Rafa Benitez. Benitez is a man that is very well known for his tactical intelligence as we'll soon find out. A no-nonsense manager that even Steven Gerrard had a difficult time pleasing. He would often play key players out of possession and would appear calm in situations where an outburst would probably be more appropriate. His methods have at times been labelled unorthodox and called into question, particularly by the English press. But his achievements, especially at that point in his career, really did speak for themselves. In any case, he was faced with rather unfavourable circumstances upon his arrival in Merseyside. Several key players were uneasy and looking to manufacture moves away from Anfield, two of which were Michael Owen and Steven Gerrard. Doesn't get more key than that, does it? Gerrard was eventually convinced to stay on and continue his captaincy. However, Michael Owen, a former Ballon d'Or winner, wasn't as convinced and he went off to Real Madrid. Nonetheless, Benitez worked with what he had and made some important additions to the squad, notably fellow Spaniards Luis Garcia and Xabi Alonso. Liverpool were looking to be in decent shape going into the next season. Despite a fourth place finish in the previous campaign, perhaps now was the moment to push on. A new manager, new players and the retention of their captain would surely go oh, oh never mind. Fifth place in the league the next season, knocked out of the FA Cup in the third round, lost in the final of the League Cup. A failure of a season for the mighty Liverpool, right? Wrong. Okay, now that we understand the history of Liverpool, the highs and the lows, you can't really argue against the fact that they should have been doing better as a club at this point, both domestically and internationally. Despite being a European powerhouse, by 2005 they definitely were not favourites for Europe's most coveted trophy. Despite that, they won the whole damn thing. At this point, you may be wondering, how? Actually, you were probably wondering that when you clicked on the video in the first place, and ever since then, you might be regretting having to sit through all of this waffle. My sincere apologies, but let's get into it. Starting from the very beginning, and they got off to a flying start in the Champions League group stages. Matched up in a group consisting of Monaco, Deportivo La Coruña and Olympiacos may not seem like a tall task today, but this group ended up putting Liverpool in quite a precarious situation. A 2-0 win to Monaco saw them top the group from the word go. However, it was far from smooth sailing from there. A string of poor results saw them head into the final match of the group stages in third place with only seven points. And then this happened. Lovely cushion header for Gerrard! Oh, you beauty! What a head shot! What a head! Liverpool ended up scraping their way into the knockout on goal difference in the head-to-head -head with Olympiacos. The next round was a little more straightforward. 6-2 on aggregate against Bayer Leverkusen. This is where things got a little tricky. Juventus in the quarterfinals. Zlatan Ibrahimovic, Pavel Nedved, Fabio Cannavaro, need I say more? A team that would eventually go on to win Serie A that year, albeit in dubious fashion. But that's besides the point. The point is that this was no easy feat. This was also the first time that the two sides had met since the tragic Hazel disaster in 1985, so the players and fans had that to wrestle with too. Regardless, a 2-1 win at Anfield featuring this incredible gem from Luis Garcia and a goalless draw in the reverse leg were enough to send them through to the semis. Jose Mourinho, Roman Abramovich, Chelsea. On a domestic level, this team finished 37 points ahead of Liverpool on their way to picking up their first ever Premier League trophy. 
They had also already beaten Liverpool three times that year, twice in the league and once in the League Cup final. Having said that, this was not the Premier League nor the League Cup. The tie ended 1-0 to Liverpool over the two legs, so great success for the Reds, but this match was not without a dash of controversy. For whatever reason, there was literally no good angle for the only goal scored in this semi-final tie by Luis Garcia. The infamous ghost goal has been a talking point for years at this point. In or out? Will we ever know? Probably not. Regardless, Lubos Michel, the referee on the night, has since come out and stated that he would have awarded a penalty to Liverpool and given Petacek a red card had the goal not been given. Knowing that, perhaps the awarding of the goal is slightly more palatable for Chelsea fans. Probably not, but oh well. At this point, the Reds had been through some pretty tough opponents, but just take a look at who they were matched up with in the final. What the hell is this? What is this team? This AC Milan squad was stacked from top to bottom. They had gone through Manchester United, Inter Milan and PSV on their way to the final match day. Liverpool had their work cut out for them indeed. Before we go into the final, let's briefly go over how the boys in red set up. Not necessarily the tactical arrangements, but just a feel for who we're dealing with. A formation that Benitez absolutely adores and that seems to follow him wherever he goes is the 4-2-3-1, that and the 4-4-1-1. Coincidentally, his first season at Liverpool was no exception as both were used at varying points. However, the 4-4-1-1 was the order of the day here. Astonishingly, this was the very first time in Benitez's Liverpool tenure that this exact starting lineup was used. Funnily enough, it was also the last. Steven Gerrard, who was typically played as a 10 that year, started deeper than usual with Chabi Alonso slightly deeper than him. Harry Kewell, who was injured for much of the season, started off in the secondary striker role with Milan Baros up top. John Onorisa and Luis Garcia filled in in the wide midfield positions with Jimmy Traore and Steve Finnan as the fullbacks. And finally, Jamie Carragher and Sammy Herpia sat at the back with Jersey Dudek as the number one. I think at this point we should just move over to the final itself. We could go on about the tactical setup of the team and how they wanted to play, but that would kinda be redundant. I say this because Paolo Maldini scored the opener for Milan with only 50 seconds on the clock, the fastest goal in Champions League finals history. Whatever tactics were in place in the build-up to the match were all of a sudden in need of a revision. Two more goals followed for Milan in the first half as Kaká, Shevchenko and Crespo absolutely ran riots on Liverpool's defence. Adding on to that, Harry Kewell walked off injured after only 23 minutes played. Things were not going well in the slightest. Or as the youth would put it, Liverpool were down bad. Half time. Boys, they had us in the first half, I'm not gonna lie. But here's what we're gonna do. 3-4-2-1. Dietmar Hamann, you're a defensive midfielder and you can press, right? We need to give Gerard freedom to attack, so you're in. Traore, you're out. Wait, wait, Finnan is injured. Okay, Traore, you're back in. Also, you're part of a back three now. Risa, you're out wide at left wing back. Schmitzer, oh hey man, almost forgot that you came on to replace Kuhl. You're out wide at right wing back. The two of you, make sure Kafu and Maldini don't keep bombing down our flanks, will you? Thanks. Everyone, don't forget to press the opposition more. That's it from me lads, go out and smash it. This is more or less what Rafa Benitez said to his team at half time of this match, I think. Just like Liverpool's ghost goal against Chelsea, this may or may not have actually happened. We'll never know for sure. In any case, whatever he actually said worked. Literally 15 minutes into the second half and the scoreline was 3-3. Understandably, the footballing world was shocked. The comeback of the century was looking like a very real possibility. Extra time came around and even more tactical brilliance came about as Steven Gerrard moved to right wing back to nullify Serginho on Milan's right flank at one point. Liverpool may have been underdogs heading into this one, but they were showing everyone that doubted them that they were right where they were meant to be. When the final shootouts came about, Milan only scored two of their penalties, Liverpool scored three. And on the topic of tactical brilliance, each of Liverpool's penalty scorers was a substitute. Benitez very clearly knew what he was doing. As you can only imagine, Liverpool's 2005 Champions League victory sits right up there with the very best matches of all 
time. It's widely considered to be the best final in the competition's long history, which tells you all you really need to know. The night was theirs, and theirs alone. They had climbed back up to reclaim that which they had claimed so many times before, and in quite extraordinary fashion. Liverpool were kings of Europe once more. During the 2004-05 season, Steven Gerrard was reportedly still having doubts about whether he had made the right choice in sticking with Liverpool. We can only imagine that a Champions League winner's medal did quite a bit to convince him that he made the right choice. A dramatic FA Cup win in which he played a massive role the very next season probably helped quite a bit too. The Gerrard final. Benitez had just about gained the trust of the press as well as any of the early doubters by this point. However, the good times were never going to last forever. They did make it to the Champions League finals again in 2007 and were even matched up against AC Milan again. However, this time they came up second best. Failure to win anything beyond his first two years in charge resulted in a six-year stay that ultimately ended in disappointment with four barren years in 2010. Liverpool experienced a few ups and downs in the years that followed. This was also coupled with a bit of a banter error, but that didn't last too long though. If you've been paying attention in the slightest, you'll know that you can never write off Liverpool for too long. This guy showed up and the European powerhouse absolutely kicked back into gear. But that's a story for another day. Turning the clock back to 2005, Liverpool may not have been in the best shape at that point, barely challenging for the league, fielding what many believe to be a subpar team in comparison to other elite teams in England and across Europe for that matter. Despite this, they fought until the very end and caused perhaps the biggest upset in European club competitions. Since this final, in my opinion, I don't think any final has even come close to producing the drama that occurred on that fateful night in Turkey. Perhaps no final ever will, but who knows? Something that we do know is that we witnessed greatness that night. We witnessed a miracle. The miracle of Istanbul. And there we have it. What do you guys think of Liverpool and their incredible history? Do you think their heroics in Istanbul will ever be topped in the final of a major tournament? Do you think it already has? Don't be afraid to comment your thoughts below. That's all from me today. Really hope you enjoyed that one. I know I did. Cheers, and I'll catch you on the next one.